I remember Bill and I were in Lake Arrowhead having lunch at the time when he had the number one best-selling novel in the country. And he couldn't believe it and I couldn't believe it. I said, Bill, do you understand? You have the number one best-selling novel in the country, maybe in the world. Wow, you know, it really was great and we knew each other so well that we could be totally honest how impressive that was without standing on protocol. By the way, that was The Exorcist. <laughs> Yes, I, I, who could not have been? I thought the book was fantastic, and I thought the film was even better because you, you could see what you were supposed to see. And uh, I knew a lot, of, a lot of, about the picture because I visited uh, Preachy, and that's where I first met uh, Bill. This girl's head went fully around. Um, you know, just the whole idea of the devil. I mean, we had, when it first came out, those special effects had not been seen before on that level. Pretending to the original Exorcist, it was uh, absolutely a game changer as far as special makeup effects. I mean, I, you know, Dick Smith is uh, what is basically, he's basically considered our, our godfather of uh, makeup effects. Um, and the stuff that was done was absolutely phenomenal and it still, it still holds up today. What was called special makeup effects really didn't exist or wasn't brought into the limelight until that film. And when you looked at the pages of Famous Monsters and you saw what this person was doing to this young girl and making her look like an absolute monster and a realistic monster was really frightening. You know, a lot of us were too young to see it at the theaters at that time. But we saw those pictures and we saw the, the artistry behind it. We were just enthralled, amazed. That I did see the film and it was really scary. That's the way I describe it. Ellen Burstyn was in the first and she was absolutely brilliant. I mean, you couldn't ask for a, a more honest or true actor. The first time I saw The Exorcist, I was, uh, the original Exorcist, I was already an adult or a young man. I wasn't allowed to see it as a kid uh, because my, I guess my mother wanted to protect me somehow, you know. It, it had gotten this real outrageous reputation. Um, so I think in that interim time, the bar for for shock had been moved, but uh, for me it was more of like the suspense of it and it was very gritty and the confines of all the stuff in the bedroom is what affected me and of course, you know, the makeup. It's scary as hell, still is. I read the book and I was Catholic and I read the book when I was a kid and we were told we were going to hell. I remember finishing the book on a afternoon after school and then hiding it under the sofa cushion so that my family wouldn't know that I had read it. Oh, God. And I, so, A, it was terrifying because the whole world was terrified by it. B, I thought that was the end of my life. I thought I'd really done a mortal sin. And I remember reading the book better than I remember seeing the movie, which eventually I did see. I wasn't allowed to see it. I was too young to see it at the time, but, and my mom didn't know I'd read the book. And Friedkin, I think was the director, was an absolute, you know, genius, so to speak. He knew what he wanted, and he got what he wanted. And the film as a result, and Blair was superb as a child. I remember I was working on Godfather II, and, uh, and out of the Gulf and Western building to begin with, getting it set up. And Exorcist I was playing uh, downstairs. and. So it was evening and it was raining and the film had opened just a couple of days earlier and the line was out the theater, around the block and all the way up Central Park West for a block and a half. And I'm walking by and there's this guy out there counting the house in the rain. And it was Billy Freakin. I said, hey Billy, what are you doing here? Because I know him. He says, I'm counting the house. He says, those guys are robbing me blind. Well, I, you know, I, of course I was, I was familiar with the original Exorcist. I mean, I was a little too young for uh, its original uh, release, but, you know, I had certainly seen it and, uh, you know, was just as scared as everybody. I knew nothing except that The Exorcist was a really, really scary movie. 
Um, but I refused to watch it. I mean, all I'd heard how t scary it was, I wasn't about to watch it. And it's funny because I would say that it's only been in the past three years that I finally watched it because Bill has been giving me a hard time about it and doesn't understand why I never watched it. So I did, but it took me till my late 40s to have the guts to do it. The original Exorcist was groundbreaking. I mean, everyone knows this and it was more I mean, it was one of the first biggest, not just blockbuster, it was an actual phenomenon. Exorcist 2, not so much. <laughs> I, and luckily I hadn't seen uh, The Heretic. Uh, I've only seen it once or twice and I was not really a big fan. It just didn't seem like an Exorcist movie. Although, I did like Father Marin's backstory when we see a, a younger Father Marin. Uh, I, I could have seen a whole movie about that. The Exorcist 2 was unfortunate for anyone who saw it. I, I can't imagine what it was like to work on it. And I, I don't talk ill of film. It was very artistic and it's just shocking to see how artsy they went with it. Um, it wasn't the same, I, you know, it, it should have been something entirely different. It shouldn't have had the Exorcist name on it whatsoever. And maybe it would have been more popular, I don't know. It was shocking to see that compared to the original Exorcist. It was the biggest piece of shit probably ever made and it, it, it you know and and they had a great cast and everybody was terrible and um, the movie was ridiculous uh, and, and boring and I just can't I cannot understand why they did that I mean why would they think to have James Earl Jones riding a big bug would be scary who knows what was going on? I, you know, there is, there are always other factors that are in play that uh, are, you know, above my pay grade. Steve Jaffe was a PR man, and I knew him, and I knew his wife, an actress, and um, he had done some work for Blatty, and they became became friends, and uh, he called me one night and said, listen, I, I got the rights. Blatty had said, uh, wanted him to help him, wanted Steve to help him, set it up in some way. Um, I didn't know all the details, because I got a phone call from Steve, he said, listen, I got a script, that's, it's, it's unbelievable. What became the book Legion uh, originally did start out as uh, William Peter Blatty and William Friedkin's idea for a sequel um, for the original. And they pitched it to the studio and the studio uh, turned it down for whatever reason. And uh, so then uh, Blatty went off and wrote this as a novel and sold it and it was, uh, you know, it was, it did very well. And uh, pretty soon, you know, when I guess Morgan Creek came around with uh, with wanting to do Exorcist Three. They, you know, they bought it, and uh, he was on board. And I think it was, uh, I think he had changed it, uh, moved it a little more away from the Exorcist in the book, but just a little bit. Um, and I think the script that he then wrote uh, for the first pass, I think, brought it a little more back into where he originally had intended it to be. And he told me that Blatty wanted to direct it, and I said, well, I'm not sure that that's doable for several reasons. I think Bill uh, will insist upon it. I, mean, I know enough about him. Secondly, the studio may not want him, and it could be a problem, so i got to find a place that will accept him. So he said, well, you want to meet him? I, you want to meet Blatty? I said, sure. So we, had, we, had, we always had a lot of meals and lunches and dinners together at the Palm and various restaurants. We had a lot of fun. And uh, he said, why? He said, well, why do you want to do this movie? So I went into chapter and verse of why I liked it and what was good about it and what were the weaknesses. And I said, well, if I get involved, I want to talk to you about it, Bill. And, you know, you're the writer, but uh, maybe you'll listen to some things. And he said, I'm always open. He said, well, what do you want to do first? And I said, uh, well, this picture, because the first one was a monster hit around the world, always regarded as probably the scariest movie ever made. And the second one was a disaster. So we got to be careful. The chance to uh, the chance to be working with the original author of uh, The Exorcist and uh, to see this direction that he originally wanted to take 
was really exciting, and I was I was jazzed. I liked that script enormously, the original script for that. In any case, the film came about, and and uh, we went to shoot it, and we were in Georgetown, and then we were down in North Carolina, um, and I was cutting all the time, um, and didn't spend a lot of time with, with, with Blatty. Bill always has a certain distance and presence when you're with him, you know, that it's, you don't have that immediacy that you try and get too quickly with a director where it's on a first name basis and, you know, you're, you're, you're getting down to the knit and grit, you know. He had a very uh, mannered set, studied style. Uh, fixed camera, very mood orientated, um, kind of slow and contemplative, you know, uh, which uh, was probably going against the grain of where film was going at that time. But I liked it still. Uh, it didn't bother me at all. Save your servant who trusts in you, my God. Let him find in you, Lord, a fortified tower. So I told Bill that I said, uh, interesting enough, as an actor that I just worked at a picture with a few years ago, was a great actor, and um, I'd say that would be the, that, that's why I think we saw him. And she said, who's that? And George C. Scott. I was so impressed and overwhelmed that I was going to make a movie with George C. Scott, who was a complete hero. I had seen him do Death of a Salesman when I was about this tall and kind of absolutely set the scene for a life in the theater. And uh, so it was the first day I had something marginal to do, stand at the nurse's station or something. So I'm on set and I'm in my thing and they're doing a shot that I'm not in. It's a, it was a scene with George C. Scott and Ed Flanders, whom I knew from the TV. And uh, so I was just like to Bill Blatty, can I watch? And he was like, yeah, of course you can watch. You're in the movie. Yeah, you can watch. And it was all hospitally, and I had that red sweater on. So the, ca the camera was on George C. Scott, and we were all, you know, the script supervisor, and everybody was over here behind the camera, obviously. Uh, I sort of knelt down, and I was watching the scene. And after, one of about, after about the third take or whatever, George C. Scott looked at Bill Blatty, and then he looked at me, and he went, that one's got to go. She's too intense. Because apparently I was just why he kicked me out. Because I was too into it. I was too. I was, and I didn't move a muscle. You know, it wasn't like I was talking or shifting or anything. I was just watching too hard. That one's got to go. And I was like, OK, if that's how it's going to be, OK, that's how it's going to be. Spring activated. Open it and it closes on its own. The character I played was a worker who I would assume did autopsies because I had a huge knife to break bones and everything. I still shake at thinking of it. I mean, you know, you get chills. It's a little stiff. Very heavy. I mean, it was made of, you know, steel. And the, the knife was believably sharp. It you, you was not something to play with. So we got to the scene, and I watched George C. Scott do a scene. One take, that was it. And I thought, one take? He's going to be satisfied with one take? I watched it for half a day. It was one take for every scene. There was no second takes. And I thought, you better be ready, kid. I mean, you got one shot, and you better be good. What's this? What? It's like just a shipping take. It was chilling, because I saw it later. And he took one take, and he said, great, finished. So I left the set and thinking, my God, one set, one take, is it going to work? Oddly enough, it did. I was totally surprised. That was probably my second day 
so I really didn't know what I was doing. And I was on day two of this film, and I knew that they, or the, that day they were gonna have the, the priest fall down the steps. And this guy was gonna go all the way down the steps. Apparently in the first movie, they only went down a, a couple of flights, and then they you know, filmed it over and over again of the same thing. I don't know what that's called. Um, but anyway, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I knew this film, this, this scene was going to be filmed, and I wanted to see it. And it was the coolest thing I've ever seen, except that the poor guy who was the stuntman, he came down, did a great job, unbelievable job, and then he hit the camera at the bottom, like, or he came too close to the camera at the bottom. And Bill kind of was like, uh, could we do that one more time? <laughs> Which I don't think this guy was probably not too happy about, but that was his job. Um, and he did it again, and he did a great job. And then they put him in an ambulance to uh, carry him off, not because he was hurt, but because I think that was part of his contract. So after you do something like that, they take you to the hospital. I will never, ever forget that scene. And that was, without a doubt, the scariest scene of all of them while we were filming. So, I mean, there may be scarier scenes the way it ended up, but that one was just too much. My boyfriend at the time, who's now my husband, he and I always had a joke about the part of those movies. The, we called them the don't go into that room girl. Oh, you know, oh, that's the scene with the don't, don't go into that room girl, and she goes in and she gets her head chopped off. So uh, I s said to Eddie, I'm actually playing the don't go into that room girl in The Exorcist 3. I was very conscious, because I, 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 I like to fancy myself a little bit of a smarty pants, you know. And I thought, okay, so that's too easy, right? That's the trope. Don't go into that room, you go into that room, and then you get your head cut off. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to actually play it remembering uh, don't go into that room, i.e. she's going to be a person at work who is smarter than all the other horror movies she's ever seen, and she's going to be like, oh, right, this is that thing where, you know, you're not, but that's stupid, because horror movies are stupid. So I very consciously played the whole thing, and when I watched it the other day, I was like, you can actually see that, where it's stupid, nothing's going to happen to you, because it's life, it's not a horror movie, and that's how I played it. However, I do remember really my first take ever and there are like a hundred people hanging around, all of them terrifying me. And I, the first, first out of the gate, I made a mistake. I was supposed to open the door at some point and I didn't open the door, I was late. And I went, oh, oh, sorry, I didn't open the door. And Bill Blatty was like, I stopped the shot, not you. And I was like, oh, sorry, yeah. I was just completely humiliated. And every time since I have ever been to work on a film set, I always think, don't stop it. You keep going until they yell cut. Whatever happens. I, you know, horror fans are the most loyal souls in the universe, right? So I find it hilarious that that scene, which, you know, ain't got no special effects. It was a six foot five guy wrapped in a sheet with gardening shears, you know, uh, that that is so powerful, you know, the absolute power of, of simplicity, right? Um, and it, it, I don't know. I actually don't know. I, I, a couple of years ago, someone said, you know your scene in The Exorcist has like eight billion hits on YouTube? And I was like, no, I didn't know that. And that was revealed to me. And then now my children tell their friends that, that, that lady's me, and their friends go, oh, awesome. <laughs> you know what's sad? The thing I remember the most was I got Patrick Ewing a Coke. <laughs> I was all excited that I got Patrick Ewan, the, the angel of death, or I don't know what they called him, but uh, got him a Coke. That was an amazing scene. That was really, really cool. Um, it was huge, absolutely huge, um, and they just did a terrific job of kind of panning along, walking along, and looking at the different people. And, uh, you know, they're all in purgatory, I guess, and uh, they were scary. <laughs> Once again, they were scary. 
So, but that was a really neat scene. Earth, come in, please. Can you hear us? We are attempting to communicate. Sam Jackson was an extra in it, and uh, he and I had actually, we'd done a play together. Yeah, we'd already done the play together. So that was, uh, that was hilarious to be, you know, going down to my film set, and he was my theater buddy, and he wasn't famous yet. He was my theater buddy on the show, and so I actually hung out with him, and I hung out with Patrick Ewing, because Sam Jackson could talk to anybody and is friends with everybody, so that was, I remember, because I had this whole other set of friends on the movie who were my new movie friends, and that day at lunch that Sam was in, I was having lunch with them, and they were like, why are you over there with Patrick Ewing and that guy? Who's that guy? And I was like, oh, they're my other friends. They're my theater friends. The living are deaf. We come here first. Lieutenant. How you doing, Lieutenant? I'm so sorry you were murdered, Thomas. I miss you. I miss you, too. So on set, Bill had a way with words, just like he does with his uh, books and movies. And one of the character or one of the crew members started a list of what he called Bladdyisms. And that's spelled with two, two D's, not two T's. <laughs> so Bladdyisms is how you pronounce it. But you know, just one example. I think I'll go exorcise. Um, another one is thus do we confound our enemies. The other one that I thought was really good, this is a true belt bladdy. Nobody ever shows me bimbos. When will I get to cast a bimbo? Bring on the clowns, the nuns, the catatonics, but never a bimbo, which I think is classic. And then another one that I really liked of his was, there is nothing less attractive than a psychotic who pouts. I think the dead should shut up unless there's something to say. <laughs> Do that rather well, don't you think? His original screenplay was much more of a psychological detective story than any overt sense of uh, uh, the supernatural and, you know, exorcisms taking place and possessions taking place and all that. He wanted to create that same fear, if you will, or that same expectation entirely through circumstance and discussion and characterization and, and, and small little teasings of the audience. Which is, if you think about it, really a very challenging idea. If anybody's going to write, write their own book and the director, that, that's great if it can be the same guy. It's, there's usual problems with that, but you do get, you do get good films occasionally. Uh, the problem is they get locked in it with every word counts, and that's we do in pictures that you're better off if you do have a little bit of communication. He just didn't want to, rep, you know, have spinning heads and pea soup. That wasn't what he was going for. It was smooth sailing. And I must tell you something, the picture was very smooth sailing, too. In, in Bill, you always saw a person who was trying to redeem himself from the first one. It was never like the, the first one was never quite what he wanted to be. The second one was unspeakable. And now it was this was going to be his version, and he was going to to somehow uh, make his case, you know, which is all good. There's nothing wrong with any of that, except where it collides with commercial interests and millions of dollars, which is what a movie is. 